Hello everyone. Hello. It's lovely to see so many map enthusiasts in one room. And we're being broadcast live actually as well on Facebook. There's actually an audience in the US and Italy and probably some places in between, so I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> um, but it's a nice, it's a nice um, presentation, nice visuals and a nice clash of arts and science basically for us to enjoy um, looking at. And another thing just to remember, if you haven't seen on our website, there's a workshop straight after. Well, there's a break and then a workshop on Ordnance Survey Maps, our historical maps viewer, at around quarter past two, and you're all very welcome to stay on and enjoy that. It's a demo, really, on how to use that, um, which is available online. So you don't have to make many notes. There's a little sheet in your pack with a few of the first notes on it, um, some of the themes and general ideas that we'll explore. Um, if you want to make a few notes on that um, as we go along. So make a start. I'm going to talk for around six hours on maps. <laughs> so I'll not at all be offended if you start filing out um, in an hour or so. So don't worry. Now map, maps basically the collections here at the Public Record Office, um, there are around 70,000 maps and cartographic materials and they're still counting. So the scope is immense for us all to access and enjoy and unravel the information that's left for us. And maps are indeed a unique form of information as they perform their own creation and they record a particular way of seeing events and ideas in the past. So they convey a spatial sensibility. They enable us to think geographically, <coughs> and that's from all disciplines and subjects, and by specific historical periods, and indeed they mark a route through our historical landscape. And we'll see that as we go, how the landscape changed, how it was perceived, how it was controlled, and indeed improved. So the types of maps that we have, basically, that, we're going, that I'm going to um, show you include manuscript and printed maps, including atlases, regional plots, land use maps, including state maps, town plans, um, military survey, technical charts, and property plot, plots. Um, so the, the variety of different map materials um, is extensive. So I just wanted to start by basically declaring what I think a map is, because I'm sure everyone in this room will, will define it differently. And that is something to celebrate, and it causes a little bit of debate. But to me, a map is a visual representation of an area. It can be real or imagined, but it involves symbolic depictions that highlight relationships between sites, townlands, regions, and indeed nations. So they depict geography, but they're not exclusively for the geographer because they present historical ideas um, without any regard to their context or scale. The thing I'm not going to include is what I would term as plans, which some people would actually interpret as maps. But plans to me are more technical, with purposes for architecture, engineering and planning. They're more geometric and they're more precise in their calculations. But indeed a plan can sometimes be overlaid over a map. And some of you will be aware of valuation plans and maps that are held within the office, which is a composite of those, which will be demonstrated in the workshop later if you can at all stay, stay on. Now in our e-catalogue, which I'll demonstrate if we have time at the end, um, most maps have these prefixes. So a D would be an original or privately deposited map. A T would be a transcript or a tracing. OS would be ordnance survey. And LR1 would be land registry, where a lot of maps are associated with legal documents and documents relating to um, property. So the first thing that I was going to look at is basically abstraction and symbolism. And it's on the little list there that you're looking at. Specifically looking at some pages that have come into the archive relating to printed maps, books, and indeed atlases. 
And this is the earliest map that we look at today, and there's about 35. And do forgive me for choosing 35 out of about 70,000 examples. But if nothing else, the challenge is for you to come into Prony, explore the collections and access something that's of extreme interest to you. Maybe your specific area, maybe a date range that's of interest to you, etc. But this is a nice early example, Ireland in 1573. It's by Ortelius, a Flemish engraver and map maker, and it finds its way in as a tracing into the papers of R.J. Hunter. Um, it's basically from a published collection of maps that were derived from travel writings in the 16th century. So very, very much, as you can see, Ireland on its back, as we would perceive it. But it was drawn by the individual who never visited Ireland, visit, basically drawing it from the travel writings. So going through the writings of individuals that had explored in the classical and medieval period, and then drawing this um, Renaissance map from those specific travel writings. So a shadow of what we perceive as Ireland today and an early example of its outline and how it was orientated. Indeed, the orientation is quite interesting because it's drawn from the direction in which the mapmaker perceived Ireland sitting there as a Flemish engraver looking across and perceiving Ireland in the way it was drawn. The next example is a map of Ireland by Baptista Basio, who basically is an Italian draftsman and cartographer. And this map again is a tracing, <coughs> but it is, it is incorporated into a very early text called Theatrum Orbis Terium, which basically translated as the theatre of the world. So basically, again, we're in the world of printed books, etc. Fabulous map, and I want to just bring it up and show you. It's around 1600, and I want to show you in detail one little part which we're close by here make just one point, so bear with me. Fingers crossed this works. So I just want to show you the R's on, on the map. Now this, this map dated 1600 basically showing key, key changes in spelling, etc. All the places that we're familiar with, this being County Down, County Antrim, there's Antrim listed. Here's Knock Fergus, and Ard with the E from the Irish, and Down, which was translated from Dun. But just looking here on the, on the middle Ards, you have something just mapped down, just as an example just for you, Phillips Town. So this is quite important, um, mapping down Phillipstown, a lost settlement that no one really knows exactly where it is. Sir Thomas Phillips setting up the Elizabethan first plantation in that area at that time. So these types of maps um, reveal so much for anyone that's interested in the landscape and the name, um, terminology, etc. So you have Killy Bay, etc. there. So they are quite detailed. And if you have time at the end, I'd be very willing to, to scroll across to the area that you're interested in, let you see it up in detail. Um, so this technically is from the first um, modern atlas that can be found. <coughs> the next example I wanted to show you, just to show you the detail, and we are we're expanding in chronology, we're now at 1610. It's from the History of Great Britain, published just around a year later. And the cartographer is John Speed, an English cartographer and historian. And this is his map of Ireland. As you can see, it is more detailed. Um, but a lot of the spellings, etc., are in their old version. And indeed, if you look at the very top, um, the hunter, you see Enishowen as an island. So it reveals quite a lot about these periods, basically 1610 or so, and indeed the landscape, and what was known about the landscape. 
the key places <coughs> and place names across um, the area. And indeed we have Smith's County, again at the arts, just to make the point of the knowledge that was being conveyed through the map at that time. Now the next one I wanted to show you um, is a, what would be termed a regional plot. So we're going away from Ireland now towards a regional plot, which is a piece of land or country that has been measured for a particular purpose. And it's about navigation. It's about the simplification of symbols um, for features and locations on the map specifically. You can see here again East Ireland, so the, the Ards again, the Kale, County Down, and um, Carlingford, etc., all mapped out with little vignettes. Um, and it's basically the, the navigation along the coast from Dublin to Carrick Fergus at that time. This map specifically, as you can see, is dated 1580, so a very early example. Um, other original hand-tinted versions um, held in Dublin specifically. Some of you may be familiar with this one. Um, it's quite popular. It's on display in the atrium outside. Um, it is Altonia um, Militaria Hibernica by Jean Blue, and it's 1654. He was a Dutch cartographer and son of the William Blue, which is a would be a more <coughs> prolific cartographer at that time. But again, it is about strategic places and prominent families and individuals within the society. I can't bring this one up, unfortunately, for you. But those at the front can see, you know, key names such as Bagnall, um, McGuinness, um, O'Neill, the Antrim families, um, County. Rain being the old name for the northwest, all mapped up there. Any shown still an island, um, but navigable <coughs> to the island at that period. <coughs> Moving on to a theme of allocation and terrain, and um, there's a survey of um, townlands and ballybows. Um, and other small denominations of Ireland um, by government around the 1600s. And this is a nice example. Um, Josiah Bodley being involved and being directed um, to make government allotments for the undertakers involved in the plantation of Ulster. So there's a volume of these basically within the collections. And the survey was completed in diagrammatic form um, <coughs> purely at verbal, as verbal information. So it's not experiencing the landscape across, it's really verbal information being drawn onto the landscape. And indeed there was a lot of controversy, controversy at that time where this, these specific maps were quite difficult. They were out of scale and they were not used for later mapping um, due to the difficulties that they were. So they're not measured in any way. But nice depiction, basically, here of County Down and County Tyrone. So you have Tyrone here, and this being County Down. And indeed, it depicts a lot of knowledge that would have been local about earlier frontiers, such as the frontier of the Earldom, which is a medieval frontier mapped on. Many sites forgotten about and missed that are there at that time, but it's the verbal information that's mapped about the earlier sites, etc., that are on the on the cartography. Another nice example from the same collection is Macquarie Boy, um, relating to the Estate of Counties, and um, County Fermanagh, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it's a lovely depiction of the early church in Ireland, on the islands, etc., White Island and Devonish that we're all familiar with. Um, lovely depiction. See how, how artistic basically they, they put into the sea um, or Loch Arn basically at this period in this area. Look at the earlier sites, the rafts, the bog land all mapped out so it's very much about navigation and about the allocation of land at that time.
I'd like to move on to more about evidence and obligation, still within the same context and the same themes. Um, we have a lovely volume of maps which is at the front and I encourage you to get your hands on them before you leave and flick through the volume. Um, there are a book of traces relating to the Phillips survey and maps relating to the North West um, illustrating London Dairy and the London Companies around 1622. Really nice images of early villages and towns forming at that time um, at the wishes of government and the London Company settlement. Now the maps of these London companies um, were created by Thomas um, Raven, but they were commissioned basically by Sir Thomas Phillips and they formed part of evidence which Phillips submitted to the King Charles I in support of his charge against the London companies um, for not fulfilling their legal obligations. The result basically was that Phillips lost his case and the London companies then were reallocated more land in that period. But it's a lovely depiction of um, that area. Um, one of my colleagues thinks this is Inch Island. Um, it's definitely in the northwest, but it is a real depiction of the settlers coming to the island on the ships and beautiful monsters all painted there within the ocean. We do like a few monsters. Within the folio, this is the, really the real treasure, basically, that we have. This is the Salter buildings at Macherfelt, spelt M-A-G-H-A-R-Y, and then F-E-L-T, so the old spelling of Macherfelt. You have, basically, the, the village laid out in both the English architecture that we're so familiar with in the Cotswolds of England, and indeed the Irish mud huts in one area off to the side, so the Irish district and the English district. And under each of the houses, from a family and local history point of view, are the names of the head of the household in 1622. And there you have names such as Rolston coming into the area, even a William Burkett who was minister to the local area, and names such as Robert Scott, and indeed, some buildings that were void, they were still being built and developed at that time. It's a really nice depiction of that. Now that it would be an English settlement and can be easily compared with something that took more Irish tradition. You see the Irish buildings more prolific within Bally Kelly, B-A-L-L-E-K-E-L-L-E. -E -E. So this is from the book um, of tracings. 1622, and you have names coming in there, such as Jones and Smart, and other names um, within the local area um, still residing. <coughs> and you can see a few Irish huts up here near the bomb without the names added on. But very interestingly, on all of these pages is a very early census of the freeholders, of the English and the Welsh and the British living in the settlement, and indeed what was termed as the natives. So here we have 39 families living in Valley Kelly who were freeholders or British, and 243 who were natives. And when you look at some of the papers that we have relating to the Ulster plantation, you get a real picture of life in these villages, including quite a lot of fighting um, around the inn in town. Moving on then to 1655, and we have the Down Survey Parish maps. I'm just plucked one out. This is the Barony of Carry from the Petty Down, County Antrim, surveyed in 1656 to 58. And basically, the Down Survey of Ireland is the first ever detailed land survey on a national scale anywhere in the world. So it is quite significant to the world of maps indeed. And the survey sought to measure all the land forfeited by the Catholic Irish in order to facilitate its redistribution to merchant adventurers and English soldiers. So the survey was undertaken by the armies of the English Cromwellian, um, commanded by um, Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell himself, 
and overseen by the Surgeon General of the English Army, William Petty, and that's why it is known colloquially as the Petty Survey. But here um, we have Rathlin, L lovely mapped Rathlin sitting in the in the ocean, or the, the Irish Ocean. We have Ballantoy, a small village appearing at that time along the coastline. And more interesting here, four little houses, and under or on top of it, Bush Town. I wonder where that would be. <laughs> so a lovely depiction basically. Hand tinted maps, hand drawn, and indeed you have a scale coming into play um, of perches into an inch. Now I've just put this up to antagonise you all. I know how map individuals like to debate, and this is one of the things I've just thrown in to make everyone think. Um, it's about audience and performance to a certain degree. Um, as you can see, it's a textual document, it's a document, a list. But I like to propose that it is actually a map. Um, a map doesn't have to be a pretty picture like the one of Ballantoy and Bush Town. It can also be a list. And this is books of survey and distribution compiled around 1680. It's a reliable information on land ownership throughout Ireland at that time. You can find them here within the Ansley Papers. And they were used basically to impose the acreage rent, which is more no better known as quick rent, which was payable yearly on lands granted under the terms of the Acts of Settlement and Explanation. So around 22 volumes cover Ireland, and they're alphabetical. And it's a real nice picture texturally of a map of walking through this area. It's a kind of reminiscent of the travel writings that would have been used to draw those earlier maps that we looked at. Where the townland, where the barony is, is written, the parish and barony. And under those are the names basically of individuals and responsibility under those. So you have the physical description of the barony. You have details about the woods, the bogs, the rivers, the soils, etc. And the information is then laid out in a parish basis. You have, from a family and local history point of view, the names of proprietors, as you can see here. 1641 from the Civil Survey. Denominations of land from the Down Survey. A number of acres distributed to persons whom they were distributed. And the rent. So it's a real a real um, treasure of information that we can picture then walking through each townland and each parish and barony from a pictorial point of view. Moving on then to the importance of the landed estate system and because of the landed estate system in Ireland I would argue that Ireland was the best mapped country in the world. It's something we should be proud of. And this is a nice example relating to Robert Colville's estate by John Sloan in the parish of Cumber, and it's found within the Londonry Papers. So we're, we're jumping towards 1721 now, and we have depicted there Mount Alexander in the middle, and the, and the, later, the later formation of Cumber Town and Village here beside the town parks where the earlier settlement would have been sited. Within this, and if you forgive me, I'm going to bring it up a little closer, just to let those see, everyone to see. <coughs> the detail basically on the map is fabulous for anyone interested in where individuals were living in this settlement at that time. You have each farmland plotted out for financial reasons then, but for family and local history we can we can access it now. And we can see here at Valley Lochan we have Mrs. Jane Meredith responsible for the rent of this land and the rental to Mount Alexander in that area. And you've other names, McKibben, Bell, um, Kennedy, I think going up you have Frazelle and Robinson. Kennedy's are still there. Yes. 
So it's really important to families that are still in the area to push their history, their personal heritage, as far back as possible. And something like this drawn in 1721 can reveal that. So back to the slides. So most uh, Manatee states will have a specific part of their archive dedicated over to maps and usually it's at the reference to the actual town land forward slash M for maps but I'll be able to demonstrate that if we have time at the end. If we're still here at six o'clock the security <laughs> might, might try to get us out but we'll, we'll try and fit it in. But really nice hand tinted drawn maps and measurement becoming more and more important um, when we come into the 18th century. Value and development. Mapping at this time is all about money. Um, value and development. Here we have a lovely sketch of the village of Clock Mills from a bound survey of lands of William Hamilton, County Antrim, and it's the papers relating to the Montgomery family. 1738. But you have arable land here, you have Clock Mills in the hill, you have the village of Clock Mills sketched in, but you have then the value or the size of each arable land and green pasture, 56 acres, two roads and zero purchase etc. So you have the hill, you have the tenements of the Clock Mills all laid out in their size and indeed the tenements belonging to the Hamilton family themselves relating to the head of the household, Win William Hamilton. So a really nice hand-drawn map or sketch of the early development of that village. Again, skipping over another part, um, we are here in Tandre Gee, and I have to point out the early spelling. The archivists will be very true to these spellings and their listings, and those that are familiar with negotiating the cat catalogues will come aware of this, so try the various spellings when you're trying to find these types of maps. This can come up very easily just typing in map Tandra Gee in the old spelling, E-R-A rather than the more recent Tandra Gee, R-A-G. But this is just nice, it relates to Sir John Bernard portions of the maps relating to Francis Atkinson in Tandra Gee Common. So you have the common or the fair place in acreage, routes and perches. But you have on it a lovely depiction of the school at one side of the fair place and here the tan yard at the other and the road stretching from Clare to Tandra Gee up through the side of the, the actual portion. And indeed there's associated maps with this of other portions which can build a picture of a local area very quickly um, through that. The efforts, I have to stress, put into drawing these maps go far beyond what is required to actually put the map down on the surface. And the efforts and the, the, that the cartographer do really is extravagant in some cases. And I have to bring this up for you. It's very difficult to see on the slides. So I have to bring this one up for you if you bear with me. have the financial detail off one side, but you have little vignettes appearing. This is in a Castle, 1772, and all the plots all laid out and numbered, and off to the side, as you saw at the, at the beginning, you have the table of all the numbers with the lists of all the individuals residing within the settlement. The church, you said, are some key vignettes of the key buildings, and indeed I have to show you at the top. Little individuals in ships leaving Loch Erne at that time. So the little, the little things that you can find when you look in detail and bring these maps up is wonderful. Um, and the effort put into them goes far beyond what basically the, the reason why they were made and the collection of rents. So the effort is definitely put in for visual effect 
and display. You may think, where would this be on display? That's something for us all to think and try and unravel. Who would have been looking at this? Who would have had access to it um, for this effort to be put in to the, the rental? So it's a map of the town of Inniskill in 1772. Back to the slides. Then we go towards amenities and the importance of um, getting water managed across maybe um, fledging Belfast, 1790, a plan of Belfast by Hugh Smith for the Belfast City and District Water Commissioners and the Institution of Civil Engineers. So you have here basically in 1790, Belfast all laid out on the map with the situation and the referencing all listed there, all drawn out to scale, with High Street obviously with water management coming down the middle of it. And the little ships off to the side <coughs> coming up the lagoon. So we're off, to, we're sitting around here and reclaim land. So it's a nice depiction and indeed Belfast is very easy to look at maps and the progression of mapping basically uh, from earlier Belfast right through to the modern times and to really draw out um, how basically the, the city developed and changed in that way. If you're staying for the workshop, the Ordnance Survey is an excellent example of how this area was reclaimed between the first and the third editions. Now I'd like to move on to manuscript land use maps. So we're more rural now and again to a certain extent they are quite attractive but some of them are quite naive they have more local uses they're for basically maybe a pacific manor or pacific parish and indeed this one is for the manor um, in the parish of Ard Straw, County Tyrone it's from the Abercorn papers hand drawn by a local estate individual and it was just basically noting down bad moss good arable or poor arable or what basically could be used within that local plot um, and the value that it would have had. So it's just really depicting exactly what in this case the map maker wanted to draw out in the landscape. But indeed they can also perform the extent of the landscape specifically. This looks very faint and naive doesn't it? The domains of Spring Hill, it is calculated and measured, plotted, but in the shadows, it's so faint, in the shadows is actually a very early vignette of the property itself at Spring Hill, just here in the middle. A beautiful early vignette of the building. Again, it is from a book of maps relating to the state of George Cunningham of Spring Hill, um, and it basically the states are both in County Londonderry and Tyrone, and it's from the Lennox Cunningham Papers of 1722. And indeed, some maps perform history themselves. We're all into um, the past, we're all enthusiasts of what the landscape was like in the past. Indeed, people in the past were as much interested in their past as well, and this type of information makes its way onto a map. This is a map and survey of William Stewart's estate of Cookstown, 1736. Very nicely hand-tinted map. Um, but on it you have rats or ring forts, whichever you prefer, in shadows and prominent properties, all mapped across this division map, um, and the routeways, etc., from them. But most interestingly, and this is something that I was surprised at, those at the front can see pencil drawing over the top of the earlier map. I'm going to bring this up because this is quite interesting. So you have the properties at that time, the proper date, 
1736, the earlier monuments, but drawn over in pencil is the planned layout of Cookstown on the earlier map. So you have the, you have the earliest settlement, the settlement there at the time of drawing, and then later it has been used by the estate to draw out the whole plan of Cookstown, cutting right through the landscape at that time. So it is quite a wonderful document, that, and hand-tinted, um, and very colourful and important um, for the development of that area. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about measure. Um, the most prolific measure within the collections would be what would be termed as Cunningham Acre. Now some of you may have come across this looking at some early maps. It is actually of Scottish origin. It's not the same as the old Scottish Acre, but it was abolished around 1824. Um, when English acres were imposed by Act of Parliament. So it is quite an early form of measure, and probably remnants of the Scottish settlers coming into um, specifically Ulster at the time of plantation. <coughs> so this is Derry Allen, County Armagh, from the Sir John Bernard portions of maps, and it's 1763. And basically here we have the highway to Tandragee, the Kersher water and the plots in between, all measured out by scale of 20 plantation perches um, to an inch. Okay? And the references basically referring to certain individuals at that time plotted out between the river and the routeway through in 1763. So quite a proportion of maps would be in this Cunningham measure. You also flat find plantation acres, the importance of plantation acres. This is a lovely early depiction um, of Cunningham Measure and plantation acres, um, 20 Irish perches to an inch, 1775. Any ideas, anyone? The domains at Mount Stewart. So a lovely, very naive map, but it really, it is, drawn out there by someone who you will find on a lot of Prony maps, who worked across the landscape surveying large estates at this time, David Geddes, and this is 1775. So Irish measure specifically was based on English measure, but it used a linear perch um, rather than an English rod, which in lay terms is basically a measurement of 6.4 metres rather than 5 metres specifically. Now, plantation acres specifically was used in Ireland, but they were also used in Yorkshire and regions bordering the Solway Firth. So they are not just distinct, basically, to um, Ireland. This map and survey relates to the domain of the Hope family, Thomas Hope Esquire, County Armagh, and it is. Um, it is surveyed by William Kelly, 1781. So you can see it's more naive, but the effort put into the titling etc. is quite extravagant. Um, and probably copies um, some earlier printed versions of estates across England. But in this case, English measure is plotted out an acre made up of four roots to four perches. 40 perches, so it's the, the, the rule of four, one acre, four roots, four, 40 perches in a Pacific route. So an acre is defined as being one furlong, which is 40 poles in length and four poles in breadth, which is around 66 feet by 660 feet in width. So measure is becoming extremely important at this time. Now move on to property plots, just to show you this, that scale is extremely important. Like we start with the whole regional plot, we're coming down in scale as well to just one single farmland. Um, a plot basically is a map or a diagram drawn to scale 
showing all the essential data pertaining to the boundaries and subdivision of that specific um, tract or plot of land and is determined um, by survey or protraction <coughs> to a certain degree. But this is quite colourful. It relates specifically to a map of Bog Head owned by James Johnston and mapped out um, by William Barnett and it's from the Boyd um, Solicitor Papers and it's dated 1829. So it's just to remember it's not just the land of the state papers you'll find maps. Look beyond those collections. Look towards the state papers as well as solicitor papers and legal papers etc. Quite colourful but here you have little rows of houses or tenements. The land of Mr. Grimes um, but basically mapping out each plot of land and the house of Mr. Johnston um, in Cunningham measure at that time. So a farm is, is technically the smallest division um, of land that would have been mapped out in that form. You've also very attractive um, financial documents relating to a Pacific plot and this is quite a small plot it's just the rental um, connected to the Burgess property in County Armagh it's in the Burgess family in the state papers 1839 but as you can see here down one side is the list of the plots that are mapped onto the onto the map the names of the individuals their acreage and their value indeed so it's a financial document but I quite like the little gentleman sailing out in that way, not May specifically. And I think they went overboard with the, the bird migration. <laughs> we'll not say anything more about that. But they're quite nice little vignettes of individuals and activity. Just to make it a little bit more interesting than the collection of rents for that plot. And indeed we have even just down to a portion, a few hills specifically. This is the division of land neighbouring the townland of Carnan in County Tyrone. It's the papers of the Alexander Gray and Lowry families, Tyrone. And this is a very rough sketch indeed. An extremely rough sketch when you look at it in detail. It's dated 1890. And indeed it would have been something folded up. It's cotton and paper folded up basically in the back pocket of an estate manager or something going around, navigating around that specific <coughs> plot of land and you have basically a, a sequence of numbers and you have schoolhouse or fields, listed arable land, so the quality of land, water, um, meadow, grey stone, so it's quite geographical, quite physical landscape to a degree. You have young plantation of of trees, you have bog land, you have the river running through. So it's basically the state manager thinking and navigating around the quality of the land and on that specific plot. So this is Hazel Hill, um, County Tyrone. Now a little bit about the skills and materials. Uh, forgive me for the marathon through so many examples, but hopefully it will inspire you to look for your Pacific area. Um, just a couple just to point out um, the skills and materials. This is a beautiful map. It's quite large, extensive map. It's of lands relating to Black Mountain, Divis Mountain and farms and parcels of land relating to the Shatsbury Estate Papers 1767. It folds in on itself and do you can order these materials out to have a close look at. It is made of vellum, okay, so it's calf skin, it's hand tinted, and um, lovely colour of green and blue, and farmland and its features are marked on it. But I like to point out, because it's vellum, it's still hairy on one side. So it's the hairier side of maps, if you forgive me for, for saying that. But it's a really nice depiction of early features such as a, a fort or raft, Black Mountain in its division, and its sides all mapped out. 
um, and it is quite quite a, a piece of, of physical map as much as the information that's on it. In contrast, you have the same mountains mapped a little later, 1820. The exact same area, would you have guessed? It's just basically the skill of the surveyor and the techniques that are used for the exact same area. So you have Divisey Centre in the middle here. You have again the acreage, um, etc. all mapped out. But in this case, it is printed on cotton paper. So again, the, the actual skills and materials and the techniques change how this, these landscapes are perceived and accessed. And indeed, the exact same area again, more or, or, ordnance survey. We have a snapshot <coughs> from the digital copies that you can access on the PRONI website. Black Mountain again from the Prony Historical Maps Viewer, which is demonstrated later on in a workshop, with the actual trig point here, which is still in existence, and all the length of chains mapped out. So this is all being measured out by chains dragged across the landscape from the trig point. So quite an endeavour in mapping, but again the Ordnance Survey being one of the most detailed maps at that time. <coughs> and there I want to just chat about basically um, military survey. You cannot talk about military survey without the importance <coughs> of ordnance and the importance of Thomas Colby, the Director General of Ordnance Survey in Great Britain. His influence in introducing ordnance into Ireland under a committee established under Thomas Spring Rice. Um, and indeed the importance of local individuals and the army basically going across the whole landscape and mapping out um, both the geographical features and the sites etc. Now the locals weren't very much involved, it was quite a military activity although locals were employed and um, indeed Spring Rice was was keen that locals were, were employed, but indeed the Duke of Wellington stopped the extent of that within Ireland and thought that the sappers and the British Army were the key for mapping out these areas. And we do have a really nice extravagant ordnance survey um, archive and a few are laid out just to show you little snapshots for you to have a close look at. It's not just the maps that we're all familiar with, it's those archives, those records, that the sappers and the army created in mapping out the landscape. So you have very early notebooks that would have been in the field with sketches, etc. Talking to Widow Smith, and she said there used to be a bridge there. Little terms like this. Um, boundary books, etc. Um, all the preparations before the maps that we are familiar with are there for us to enjoy. The best preserved area would be the Dungiven area. And that's just little drawings and little little um, notebooks that would have been drawn out like that. The thing that interests me within that collection is something like the name books. Who decides the official spelling of an area or a town land? We have name books where the army was actually asking local individuals, such as the local doctor or the justice of the peace, what is the official spelling for this area? And that became that official spelling. So all the earlier spellings um, that we were looking at would have been lost, and the ordinance standardized language to that extent. The boundary notes are extremely important, quite mathematical as well, and I would encourage you to have a close look at those. But this is what basically people then are more familiar with, the detailed first edition um, of the, the Ordnance Survey in Ireland. This is Dungiven surveyed 1832, engraved the same year, but made available later towards the end of 32 and the start of 33. So all of the information of when a map would have been captured, 
drawn, signed off by the officials, are all on the original manuscript examples um, that we have here in custody of Prony. So we have town plans, county series, the Irish grid series, etc. So we have the 1820s, 30s, the 30s to the 50s, and the Irish grid series approved 1950. So it's quite extensive, basically, um, what you can unravel. And indeed, the, the, the map viewer will give you transparencies and um, you can basically look at the different editions and how the landscape changed through that. So just a few more. I know we're, we're running towards the end. Just the last few things, really, that sometimes is a surprise to individuals that we may actually have something else um, other than the familiar maps that we are familiar with. Charts, special purpose maps, designed and maybe for navigation or specific information or data. This is a map of part of the new intended line of road from Newry to Castle Wellham. Um, it's from the Downshire Papers 1814, mapped out by James Wilson. So you have familiar um, locations such as the Crown Bridge, etc. here mapped out and the intended line of the road, etc. Um, from that, that area. Nice printed maps um, from moving into the 19th century. So that's communications. You have also the importance of geology. This is quite a rare map in my view. Um, it's a map of Inishowen Peninsula, Donegal, by William Craig, an important map maker in the 1860s. And it's the papers of Steele and Nicholson families, Belfast and Baloo Bangor. Um, but look at the detail and the effort put into the geological features in a map such as this. And the effort put in in the 1860, and the, it really gives you an idea of aspect um, on a 2D surface. Legal rights, map of transfer of land under the land judges, so rentals and particulars of sale, um, after probate, the importance, maps appear everywhere within the collections. Could be attached to a will, could be attached in this case to to land under the land judges, a land registry. So maps are everywhere. It's such an important means of communication within um, the archive here and in the past. And indeed, the last one to show you, so we've raced from the 1570s right up to 1917, and a trench map. So navigation and protection, transfer along safe transfer along the landscape basically. This is a part of Belgium from the Percival Maxwell Papers 1917 showing the trenches in red but also showing the positions of machine guns, trench mortars and the railways. So it's about navigation protection and the importance that map reading was even within many professions. So that was all I was going to show you today and thank you very much for listening and encourage